Okay, so the question is how to value your startup pre-revenue. And it is not a simple, straightforward answer. There's multiple ways to skin the proverbial cat. So I'm going to give you how you can look at it and you have to sort of pick the methodology that works for you. So first, I'm going to explain the first way is the traditional method. Okay, the traditional method. And when you are pre-revenue, so you have no history whatsoever. This is the reason banks won't give you a loan, anything like that. The straightforward, simple answer is it comes down to your negotiating skills. That's, yeah, I wish there was a better way to explain it. It all depends on you. So you have to decide how much do you want to give away for what you have to be able to argue. This is my revenue. Here's my pro forma. I think we're going to be worth this amount of money, all that stuff. Right. And so I don't know. And it depends also on the investor. Like an investor may go, you know what? I believe based on the numbers, et cetera, that, yeah, I'm going to give you the million dollars and, Okay, yeah, it's worth a $10 million company. If you say 10%, that's worth it for me. So you're in the Shark Tank scenario right there. It's all about the Shark Tank. So if you think about it, like what happens on Shark Tank is that um, they say, and I'm asking for a million dollars for 10% of the company. And all the sharks go, um, they, they, you know, they stop and they, you know, Ted pull their fingers and they, oh, that means you think you're worth $10 million. How do you come to that? What's your revenue? They start beating you up. And so it's all about the negotiation when it comes to that stage when you're pre-revenue because you have no numbers. You can't add a multiplier to your EBITDA, you know, all those things. Like you got nothing to work with. You don't know. So it comes down to your negotiation. Now, are there methods where you can um, – that wait, are there methods where you you can come up with a number that seems fair? Yes. Okay. There are what are called third party methods. So these we've used these before. This is where you go to someone who is certified in a specific method of how to value a company, and then they give you a certificate and a little stamp of proof and say we've looked at it based upon this, you know, all all that stuff, um, you know, and and it works. A lot of a lot of friends, family, and associate investors, not professional capital. Professional capital, you know, they'll only accept this if you, you know, are in a private equity situation or you're in a buyout or something and you go to a large accounting firm. Let's say you go to Deloitte and, you know, Deloitte and you say, hey, can you value our company? And they go through it and say, stamp approval. And the private equity company says, yes, we believe in Deloitte. There are people you can go out and you know pay seven hundred dollars to or what have you, and they'll give you something with a little medallion and they'll sign off on it and say, "This is my valuation based on my expertise in the methodology," which includes things such as looking at other publicly traded companies, looking at history, acquisitions, all that stuff. That's what it boils down to. Now they get better the more information you give them. So we had this one time done, and we gave them the initial pie in the sky. And he evaluated us a certain way. Then we had a year of revenue. And then we did another round of financing. And then he gave us another price per share, which was obviously better because we had better data, you know, on that. Right. So um, the question that we got here in the chat for the negotiation piece, is there a best practice outline or whatnot for negotiation as in where does I hardly know what seems fair? So again, it's you investor third party. So this is how it works. So st step one is, you know, one is you have to decide how much am I willing to give away? So you have to decide how much do I need? How much do I want to give away? What do I think is worth? Then you get feedback from investors. Okay, what would you normally do? We're going to talk more about this. And then you can go to third party. You may talk to the investor, say, what, do we, what happens if we go to the third party, you know, et cetera. Right. You may be completely out to lunch or what have you. Now, the reason I say go to third party last is, you don't know, necessarily want to spend the money. But some people go to the third party first, but you never know. Now, here's the thing. The third party people and the investors will always tell you that um, 
to always tell you that every founder thinks their company is more valuable than it actually is. So get ready for that. So let me give you the, the, the methodology in terms of negotiation is that there is always two parts of negotiation. There's the money and then there's the terms. Pick one. Pick one. You can get the money that you want, but you have to give the investor the terms. You get the terms that you want, then the investor is going to say, well, I'm only going to give you this amount of money. Most of the time, the power comes in the terms. The terms are where the power is. So, for example, you may say, I need $10 million. And they may say, okay, I can write you that check, but I want this. It's what happens on Shark Tank. Shark Tank, they say, okay, I'll give you that money, but I want these terms. And sometimes they're brutal and they, they'll only give you a certain amount of money and they want to control the terms. Never do a deal with Shark Tank, by the way. Okay. It's, it's not reality, but you get an idea of the mechanics. So if you need $10 million, well, the more money that you need, the more terms you're going to give up. Percentages, pro rata rights, super pro rata rights, you know, all board seats, all that stuff. So you have to decide how much you're willing to give and play and all that stuff. And you have to develop that those parameters first. But those parameters will begin to change over a period of time as you get investor feedback. Now, remember, third party nego or negotiations or third party evaluations when you're pre revenue are all pie in the sky. It's all conjecture. So it's always good to get an idea where you stand based upon industry standards after you generate revenue. But this is the traditional way. So feel free to type in the chat if you got any other questions in the traditional way. Let me expand and just, you know, for everybody here, I'll save this if you want it let's talk about the next way and i'm going to call the startup way okay and the startup way starts with something called kick the can down the road i just made that up so don't quote me on that all right so the startup way is investors have become wise and founders and said there is no way a snowball's chance in hell that a founder knows how to value their company pre-revenue. Let Even revenue generated. You have no idea what your company's worth because these companies have such an asymmetric upside. They could completely disrupt a massive industry. And that's the reason investors look at TAM, total addressable market first, right? To see if this is in the ballpark. So they say, let's kick the can down the road. And they kick the can down the road using a, you know, a version of a convertible. A version of a convertible, which is called a SAFE. SAFE stands for um, Simple Agreement for Future Equity. So they kick the valuation can down the road. Here's how it works. All right. So founder, we have no idea how much your company is going to be worth. So in the meantime, let's do a convertible note, a convertible debt. I'm going to lend you the money. So I'm going to lend you your, your 10 million bucks, but I want 8% on that money. And when you raise based upon that priced round, that is the price that I'm going to get in at, at either a discount or there's going to be a valuation cap. Okay. So the convertible has got multiple pieces to it. Let me break it down. There's a maturity date. Wait, will you just repeat that last part? So like an investor says, hold on, 10 million for 8%. But okay, so let me explain well, this. Right. Okay, let me break down the, the, the pieces. So there's a maturity date. And then what happens is there is either a discount or a, value, a valuation cap, discount or cap. Or a combination of both, something called um, uh, oh, most value, most most favorable nation MFN clause, which just basically states, "I want the best price that you've given to anybody else." Like I reserve that right. Okay, so and then there's interest. So here's how it works. 
So every convertible note has maturity date. It says you have three years to do something with my money. During that time, okay, you're going to be paying interest on that money. We'll agree to how much interest you're going to pay, et cetera. There's no, you know, there's no price round. Shares have not been exchanged. And then what happens at the maturity date, you either pay back the debt or you shut down your company. Or you agree and you renegotiate. Now, let's say during that time, you raise $10 million, you go and raise another $20 million at a priced round, okay? And you value your company at $100 million, right? Then they will get their $10 million converted into shares at either a discount. So say you sell it at a dollar per share and they had a 20% discount, they get $10 million in shares at 80 cents a share. Or there's a valuation cap. They say, you know what? We're not, we're only going to agree at $5 million valuation cap. So, or no, sorry, $50 million valuation cap. So let's say that you value your company at $100 million. Then what happens is they say, oh, you know what? We want our shares converted at $50 million total value of the company because that was in the contract. So you have to sort of agree to look in the future. And most startup investors will ask for a valuation cap. Um, our fund, we don't do valuation caps. Uh, we actually do discounts. Because we're like, whatever you negotiate, if your company is worth $100 million and we're going to make 20% of our money at that time, that's good enough for us. But a lot of startup, um, especially more riskier startups, there's a valuation cap. Now, there's interest that you accrue along the way, and you're either paying that interest or that interest gets rolled into the conversion. You know, it depends. Now, the safe note here gets rid of the maturity date and the interest. So you can look online and just look up Y Combinator, Y Combinator, safe note. And they have all the contract language and they explain everything for you in terms of how to structure a safe note. The advantage of a safe note um, is real simple. You know, let's kick the can down the road. Let's not worry about uh, valuations and all that stuff. And we think we'll be worth $10 million or all that stuff. Down the future. Think, okay, yeah, if you think so, great. You know, let's play it, you know, type thing. Uh, and they're going to evaluate it. Now, here's the important part about startup investors. And, you know, Brian and Maggie, all of you need to put yourself in this mindset. Remember how I said the price and the terms, okay? Startup investors care less, could care less about how much money, they do care how much money they give you. Let's let's say they deprioritize how much money they give you. The more, the bigger priority is how much of the company that they own. That's the reason there's no standard. So think of it from a startup perspective. If they're making 10, it's, let's say this is, let's take, take a really small fund. And, you know, let's say it's a eh, good size fund, $100 million. And they're going to put a million dollars in every other start, in every startup. And so they invest 100 startups and they put a million dollars each in them. 90% of those startups will fail. So they're going to lose, they know they're going to lose $90 million. Okay. So now they have $10 million at play. One of those startups is going to go unicorn and the, the rest are either going to break even or sell for a bit of profit. How much of your company, billion dollar company, do they need to own to at least break even on their fund? Just think about the math. So say you become a billion dollar company and they've just lost a hundred, a hundred million dollars and they put in you a billion dollar company, they need to own at least 10% of the company to break even. Now they need to make a return. So what are they gonna do? You know what? We need to eh, we're gonna need 30% of your company, 20% of your company. Because if you become a billion dollar company, we need to be making 200 you know, million dollars or 300 million dollars to give our investors the return that they need at least, right? So 
This is where it gets crazy, but founders don't understand that from an investor standpoint, this is professional capital. They've got their limited partners and they've got their business models that they have to um they have to fulfill. They've got their partnership agreements. So you may be talking, Brian, to an investor who's coming from that type of money, and they may be asking for exorbitant terms that you may be like, whoa, wait a second. And they the, and they'll say, Well, how much money do you need? They'll give you the money that you want, but they say, We need 30% of the company. You know, to make this happen, we think this is going to be a unicorn and all this stuff. And they'll start to negotiate. And this is where this is where founders who are sitting on high profile, high quality, there's something called a flight to quality right now, and pedigree startups that there's a bidding war over. Companies or investors will say, Can't, you know, I know you're raising a million. Can you take two? Can you squeeze me in at two at this round? Because they want, they need to own that certain percentage. So the moral of this story is not all investors are equal. It depends on who you're dealing with. That's the reason you start with who am I? What am I willing to give up and negotiate? And then who am I talking to on the other side of the table? And what vehicles do they need? All right. So as a summary, and then we can get into some questions. As a summary, go through these steps. But you can have the traditional method, which is all starts with all negotiation and could end up, or you can go the startup method and each has its own sort of thing. So there's, you know, you, them, and then third party. So you can access all those huh, third party can't spell. Okay. And then the startup method is kick the can kick the can and then their safes which are a version of convertibles um, which basically says no we're not going to value our company you know right now there's no valuation we can agree to future caps okay so there's discounts and then there's caps one last piece of advice that i would sincerely give if a professional investor asks you um, how are you value, valuing your company? Okay. You really shouldn't be giving them an answer, even if you have one in your mind. That's a, a it's an amateur move. Okay. You don't want to put something out there and then set yourself up for weakness. The answer you should be giving is, well, actually, it's not my job to value my company. The market does that. My job is to increase the value of the company, how the market values what, what I'm doing as a CEO, that's up to them, just like a publicly traded company, right? The CEO doesn't go out one morning and say, I think our price, our shares are, should be $15 a share. No, it doesn't work that way. Goes out and says, we're making this amount of money, we're doing this strategy, we've opened this strategic alliance, et cetera, and then the the shareholders buy and sell shares based on what they think, right? Wall Street gets involved, everything like that. It's the same way with companies at your stage. My answer is always, well, that's not my job. But I can tell you that we have investors and they are looking at this price and that price. And our last equity round was at this round, you know, et cetera. And here are all the great milestones we're doing that that we're achieving. And every, any investor worth their salt, we can say you can look at um, our plan and you can look at our projections and you can decide. And we're going to go with <laughs> what we think the best price is now. The best price does not always mean the best deal, as we talked about. And here's the other thing. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. You know, if you're if you think you're at a dollar a share and someone comes in and blows you out of the water and says, I'll give you five dollars a share, mm, think twice because you get five dollars a share and you take all this money in, expectations go up. What if you don't perform? Then you're doing down round and everybody's mad at you. Everybody's mad at you. So what I'd rather do is go in at a dollar share or a valuation cap at $5 million 
and then do it for a certain amount, taking a certain amount of capital. And then my next round of safes, if I take in, I'll do it at a value cap of $7 million. So that automatically sends a signal to all my investors, you got it in early at the right time, going to reward you. I'd rather step it up, take less money, and I'd rather take it in steps. Now, sometimes you get offered a big pile of money and you're like, oh, I really want that dry powder in the war chest, and you take it. I know founders that have done that, and in certain market conditions, yes, I advise take the money, give up the equity, take the money because money's at a premium right now, and that's the market condition. So back to my last point, when someone says, what's the valuation in your company? Don't answer that question. You only set yourself up for weakness. My answer is um, tell them we're going to let the market decide, but here are the indicators and the signals that we're working with. Okay. All right. So, okay. Great comment. Um, I've always told always consider other people's money first as a bootstrap i'm inclined to go sba loan get a little more development done thinking okay yes the whole other people's money is so stupid like wh whoever came up with that term and use other people's money that's the dumbest thing ever okay um now it's easy to access other people's money for sure it's easy to lose other people's money and say ah no harm no foul but i tell you i've I've lost copious amounts of investors' money back in the day, and that's not a good feeling whatsoever. And, you know, I have to put my head on my pillow at night. Here's the thing. A lot of people, a lot of startups, they can't afford to bootstrap, um, even if they could because the market conditions, they need the money to grow fast. Like, you know, Mike, you go and you have that conversation with that potential strategic partner and they say, let's do it and all these things. And now you're scrambling and all of a sudden all these restaurants and everybody's coming on board. You know what's going to happen? Somebody else is going to say, hmm, Mike's got a really good idea. I heard about this, you know, et cetera. You're going to need money for that growth to stay ahead so that nobody with $300 million can come eat your lunch. So in certain cases, yes, absolutely. If you have a grow fast you need to get a certain share of the market like Uber did before you start making money, which is going to be very rare in this case, or you want to protect yourself and you need funding. Yes, go get the money. But the at the early stages, taking money in from investors is the most expensive equity you're ever going to sell. So quite frankly, I, I don't have co-founders anymore because the amount of equity and all the headaches that I've done. And I don't like uh, VC money, even though I work with VC money on a daily basis. I don't take VC money into my own startups. I don't because like the games and all the extra stuff that I have to take on. So I'm a bootstrapper through and through. I'd rather own, like they said, I'd rather own a larger piece of a smaller pie than own a very small sliver, a bigger pie and have all my mental health and everything, and all the pressure and all that stuff. Go. But that's just me. You have to know yourself, right? And I also agree, I've been working with debt primarily for the past few years. Debt, debt, debt. Debt financing, alternative venture financing, using debt, non-dilutive financing. I'm a big fan. SBA, as soon as, you know, that money became available, we went and took SBA loans, you know, et cetera, you know, during the pandemic. So I highly recommend if you're that type of person, I don't like anybody in my grill, in my kitchen. You know, you know, I had a professional chef tell me just because you know how to cook doesn't mean you deserve to be in a kitchen, right? Just because you can chunk money into something doesn't mean you're allowed to be in my kitchen, right? So I'm 100% all about bootstrapping. Okay, so great comment. All right, so I'm going to end the recording now, and then we can get to, uh, back to some other questions.